So let me let me start first, you know, that with uh, with uh, uh, Stefano, who will have the Stefano Grimas, who will speak about the Udina chart, you know, that and resilient hence this is the title of his presentation. Everybody has about 20 minutes, and and I would like to inform you that in the end of the of the lectures, we will have a panel discussion, and these gentlemen will be the member of the panels. And, and that time you can ask questions or comments of their presentations, but not after, the, after their presentations, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation in this very important uh, uh, conference. Uh, I, I will explain you that the Udin HR, that is a result of the first uh, um, network that we launched uh, uh, last year in Udin, uh, with the, um, under the umbrella of the UNESCO uh, uh, United Nations. I'm the chairholder of the UNESCO chair in, uh, in Udin on intersectoral safety for disaster risk reduction and resilience. And we try to create a sort of network among the different uh, uh, UNESCO chairs in the Central European area. This is why we start last year to have a um, collaboration also with uh, COSEC uh, um, UNESCO chair. I try to go ahead. Okay. Um, just to give you the context uh, uh, why we start with this uh, um, initiative. Uh, we start with the uh, um, agenda 2030 of the United Nations, in particular the Sendai framework regarding the disaster risk reduction. Uh, in 2022, uh, the Global Assessment Report uh, uh, make a sort of call uh, saying that it's important, uh, uh, very necessary to transform the governance for a resilient future. And they pose on the, on the table some questions that we try to uh, explore like expert, like um, network of experts, uh, in order to give some recommendation, new approach, because they underline that new approach are needed, taking account the uh, complexity of the situation of nowadays, the uh, systemic risk, the uncertainties, and so on, that uh, change the way of facing uh, the problem. So for this reason, uh, our, uni our UNESCO chair and the uh, uh, government of our region and the Central European Initiative uh, launched the, the Resilient Hands program for the implementation of a series of activities uh, uh, to try to give some support to this uh, call, in, in particular in order to create some recommendation and reference guidelines uh, to create a, an uh, interdisciplinary network uh, between experts, uh, but also in strict contact with the government, the policy maker, the decision maker, in order to promote uh, an holistic approach and uh, uh, give some uh, ideas, first of all, for uh, go ahead with resilience, uh, this is the, the, the name resilient ANS. No? This is the, uh, the idea. Uh, we launched the, the event uh, last October in Udine, and as a result of this first uh, network was the Udine chart with the recommendation that uh, came up from, from this uh, uh, initiative. Uh, as you can see in the, in the map, we involve different uh, uh, UNESCO chairs and uh, uh, institutions in the area of the Central European Initiative and the uh, UNESCO directly from Paris and the UNDRR in uh, in Belgium. Um, why we start to discuss about this? This is the chart, it's a very short uh, chart. Uh, I give you an overview in which I try to put some uh, um, main points uh, for uh, looking ahead uh, in this process. Now, rapidly, I point the different uh, elements, uh, give you the reflection that we did uh, during the uh, that three days in, in Udine. First of all, uh, with the chart say we member of the resilience platform, recognize the importance of complexity, uncertainty, and seismic uh, nature of risk in the transformation of existing governance. We use this uh, uh, conceptual uh, 
uh, framework in order to say the four priorities of uh, the Sendai framework are directly related to the decision-making process. First of all, I need to understand the risk, then I have to take decision, then I have to pass to the action in order to reach a, uh, a goal. What is important is to take in account that we need to pass to the action. Um, sometimes we go in a deeper, deeper way in the evaluation of the risk, but not always we pass to, to the action. And the other thing, after the action, we change the situation and we need to restart with the process. This process, that is the, the, the governance, requires a new um, approach. Why? Because the context <coughs> is changed in this, in, the, in this last uh, years because it's complex, uncertainty, uh, that there is an uncertainty, and also there is a systemic risk, nature of the risk. Um, the same document uh, of the UNDRR uh, give us a sort of metaphor that we follow. They say, try to think the governance process like uh, the, when you have to play a game. This is the, the suggestion that uh, UNDRR gives us. We take this uh, suggestion. So this permits to introduce a first uh, 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 reflection exist some players that play the games, and there is what we can call observers, who is out of the game. Uh, think uh, the law and who is called to, to do something. There is different uh, subjects in this uh, governance process. The other aspect is that uh, we have to play the game in all the four phases, main phases of disaster management cycle, in the response, in the recovery, in the provision and prevention, in the preparedness. And the games are different in the different phases. So this means that we need to take in account this uh, aspect. The other aspect is the importance of the context, because nowadays we, we say that we are in what we call new, norm new normality, the new normal, that uh, is characterized by surprises, complexity, disruption. Not all is controllable. If you think the COVID, problem or also the, the war create uh, surprises that change everything in the governance, in the governance process. Uh, we have also some unexpected development of the situation and uh, all is in a continuous change. This is the first uh, uh, evaluation. So we say we, we need to move to, to a process like in a boat, this is the, the, the second metaphor. If you are in a boat, you cannot control the sea. You have to change your way to go ahead, taking account of what happened in the sea. This is why we introduced the concept of the complex system to monitor the situation, to anticipate the situation, to adapt and learn step by step. And this is a continuous process that has to take, take in account also that can happen some <laughs> events that are not foreseen. This change everything along along the way. This is what we start to think. It's uh, like if we need to navigate in different uh, seas in the, in, in the four phases of the disaster management cycle. Uh, regarding the complexity, the, the dimension, obviously we discussed also yesterday in, in, in COSEC, there is the physical dimension, but there is also the human dimension. There is the technological dimension, there is the organizational, economical, there is a lot of dimension. There are different scales, local, global, and so on, but it's different time of scales. Everything is well known, but what we need is to put together this uh, in a holistic way, because otherwise the complexity is not possible to face. If you come back on the metaphor of the boat, if you think on the boat, we have the human, the technological, the everything is working together in a sort of decision-making process along, along the way. This is the first aspect. The other aspect is that uh, the, the, we, we need to produce some ideas to pass to the, uh, uh, in an interdisciplinary way, to the, the, the decision makers. Uh, means that around the table we need also decision makers, policy makers, and so on, in order to discuss together about this uh, uh, sort of co-production of recommendation solutions and tools. Uh, 
we adopt what uh, we use in our UNESCO chair, like um, is a, an approach is uh, called intersectoral safety, that uh, take in account, like in a, we use the, the boat, but if you think the rafting, when you go rafting, you don't know what happened next. But you have to be able to face what happened in a continuous way to rebuild. So you need to foresee in the future, but you don't know what is the future. You can have more than one future. You have to prepare yourself along the way in order to face uh, the problem. But the problem requires an intersection be between human aspects here and the uh, um, physical aspect, taking account of different contexts and using the previous process of uh, anticipation, uh, monitoring, anticipation, adaptation, is a sort of navigation. This is also in the UN documents, they suggest uh, the metaphor of govern li like a navigation. Um, this permits to create a sort of bridge between the science and decision maker and policy maker and practitioner, in which the link is we need to know, like a scientist, what are the need from one side. At the other side, the scientists have to give the, the, uh, the knowledge as is necessary, not, not with the language of uh, scientists, but in order to pass the knowledge that is uh, necessary to solve the problem. Um, <clears throat> other aspect is that we want, with this network, to produce like a final result. Uh, the first of all, of course, was the, the Udine chart uh, that summarized the first discussion. But the idea is to create a sort of uh, um, series, or, or series of, of books, um, policy briefing, or the, the report of the discussion in order to share all the results uh, among the, not only the partners, but uh, inside of uh, Central European Initiative, at least. And, <clears throat> and we try to define a sort of uh, comprehensive framework to use permitting the different disciplines, the different actors with different uh, expertise, different uh, history also the, in terms of uh, professionality and, and role, to work together and understand each other. The idea is to create a sort of land that uh, creates uh, this uh, common language. We start to propose this land and we, organize, we will organize uh, next uh, November a field trip in order to try to check uh, if uh, this uh, process is working, is, uh, um, could be improved, and so on. Why? Because if you remember the governance like a, a boat, there is the players on the boat, but there is also the spectators or the observer outside. And if you try to think a problem in this figure, you have, uh, in, the, in the middle you have a cylinder, but if you look from one side is a, a square, from the other side is a circle. What is true? Everything is true. But the reality is, if you put together all the uh, point of view, you know better the reality. That is all of these three elements. This is why what is important is to put together the point of view of player, the point of view of the observers, and the point of view of the scholars. This is the um, point that we want to, uh, <coughs> to, to try to introduce. For the same problem, it's like, we, we have to look from over the time, history, history can uh, uh, read the, the history over the time, players, the, the administrators are on the game, and scholars uh, take in account uh, what uh, is learned by, by uh, the past. We produce a, um, a site, in order, in a website in which we put every uh, document that we will prepare, and uh, at uh, uh, today is uh, this network is created, put together uh, UNESCO, UNDRR, other agencies of the related to UNDRR. There is also IASC and uh, the, the different UNESCO chairs in, in the area, but all is uh, promoted by the Central European Initiative that permit in the future also to create the knowledge transfer to the diplomacy uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Just to, <coughs> to finish, uh, we launch the, um, the platform and, and like a final uh, uh, sentence of the Udine chart, we uh, suggest to 
to the donors to continue to support the platform like a first uh, uh, because it was the first uh, experimental uh, uh, meeting after this uh, chart uh, taking account the result they found now we have the, the possibility to go ahead and uh, uh, we have a program uh, till uh, the end of uh, 2025 with field trips webinars workshops workshop. And this permits to create a sort of think tank in order to facilitate the process request for the different countries of the Central European Initiative in this goal of the Sendai framework and so on. As I told you before, next 6th and 7th November, we have already organized a field trip in the area of, uh, of the north part of Italy where it was uh, affected by the earthquake in 1976, like a um, case uh, to, to use for uh, testing the CREF, uh, the, the, the framework that we propose. Uh, looking forward for the future, the, our idea is to have this network that is moving in different cities. What we hope is that Udine Char was the first, but uh, why not uh, Vesprens, Kozek, or other cities in the, in, inside of the um, European initiative, like a result of this uh, network that is moving in this, uh, in this area. Thank you for your attention. and I hope so that you will have uh, questions and we can challenge a little bit your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask the next speaker, Charles Fulesh-Marty, the professor of the New York City University. And he's having an interesting title, Global Local Risk. Charles. I'd like to first say that's not my title. That's Ferenc's title. Um, and when I first uh, looked at the agenda and I looked at the title that was given to me, I started to shake my head and say, oh my gosh, what are you supposed to say about this? Because this has everything in it. It's got global, it's got local, it's got risks, it's got nature and society. So what I decided to do is I decided to cut the problem into pieces and I'm gonna try to share with you uh, some of my insights from my own work uh, over the years. Uh, that might be relevant to the design of craft thinking, in particular, applying it to specific regions, uh, like Pannonia. Uh, do I press ahead, or do you? Oh, okay. Okay. Nothing happened. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, um, so let's dive into this. So I thought that it would be best to uh, divide and conquer this um, very, uh, in some sense, abstract set of notions. And a lot of people, I would say that if you added up all the key words here, at least in the field of Earth system science, there are probably thousands of people working on some element of this. And so what I tried to do is I tried to group this into some sensible uh, ways to um, attack the problem. So I would like to speak now to this issue of scaling, and in particular, uh, looking at global and local aspects of the question. I come to the uh, issue as an environmental scientist, but more particularly a water scientist, water resource expert, and I'll draw off my um, experience in that field uh, to try to connect some dots here. Okay, um, so first of all, this idea that there are local aspects of environmental challenges and global aspects uh, is an interesting dichotomy that um, even about 10 years ago was still alive and kicking within the community. Uh, back in 2015, there were, was a set of debates uh, in Science Magazine as uh, sort of the op-ed section of that uh, journal. And the first debate had to do with looking at water security problems from a local versus a global perspective. And that was, in fact, the dichotomy. Okay? 
Um, I was reminded several times, some of you might know this guy, I think you must, uh, Janos, uh, Mike Muller, who uh, was, we, we were the bane of each other's existence. Uh, he's a South African water manager and very much dedicated to the notion that, uh, like politics, water issues are all local. And I was part of a nascent group at the time, in the early part of the century here, uh, trying to argue that we have to look at things a bit more globally because there are larger patterns to be reckoned with. It's not just a local set of problems. And I fully would agree with him that when water problems arise, water challenges arise, there is a spectrum or diversity of ways in which humans manage or mismanage, react or don't react to impending problems, okay? as everything from sanitation, access to clean water, which is hyper-localized at, at the household level, uh, to engineered water systems, you know, building dams and reservoirs that would serve uh, downstream populations. Uh, for example, uh, storing irrigation water or, or drinking water. Water for development in terms of uh, industrial um, requirements uh, to run the economy are also, in many, many cases, planned out at the very local level, okay? So I'm not gonna disagree with him about that. But there are also things that are happening at broader scales. And I'm just gonna sort of take a physical view of this and make the statement that river networks have this amazing propensity to translate problems from upstream areas of watersheds right down quite literally to the coastal zone. And this set of images here on the, on the uh, top left, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. On the top left, uh, oh yeah, okay, are the little drainage systems that um, are contributing runoff and pollutants and sediment and signatures of human involvement on the landscape level, so you could Take this area, it's you know, South, Southeast Asia, you could split it into thousands of little pieces and make statements about what's happening on the landscape. Okay, here's, we're getting at the, the land, sound, and waterscape idea. But then eventually what's happening on the landscape percolates through the system, oh, I'm sorry, that's not showing, through these river networks. And the river, river networks are these, uh, transfer functions that take all of what's happening across the distributed um, landscape and condense it into river flow and then translate it ultimately to the coastal zone. And that's that last arrow here, just showing that you know what's happening here in the uplands really does affect the coastal zone, okay? So I know that we're, we've been thinking about fresh water, we've been thinking about regional development. It's also very important to remember that we live, all live in watersheds, and what happens here does eventually get down to the, the coastal zone. Just as one example, I've worked on, and I'll show you some work that we've done on deltas. Uh, the world's reservoir systems trap about 30% of the natural flux of sediment going to the coastal zone, and that's not a really a coastal zone-derived problem. It's derived from water resources way, way upstream, thousands of kilometers upstream. So I just make the statement here that if we're trying to think locally, if you're thinking about water, you cannot, because the rivers and the groundwaters are forcing you to think more broadly, spatially. Okay. Um, now, as part of what gets translated downstream, uh, in particular in um, transboundary basins, and we could be talking about transboundary basins across nation states, but we could also be talking about transboundary issues and potential conflicts within a country, like, for example, the United States and the Colorado River, which is shared by many political entities called states. So even though they're part of the US, you have all of these legal challenges and uh, cultural problems and uh, struggles uh, that have to do with the sharing of water and the fact that water is often a very, very scarce resource physically. It also can be chemically a scarce resource because of pollution. 
and they're people vying for the resource. So naturally, when people vie for the same resource and it's scarce, there's going to be conflict. And so what, what I did with my colleagues, and, and I um, would turn your attention to the 100th anniversary issue. Let's see if I could say this. Hydrologioi, right? Because Len, um, journal, thank you. <laughs> I did my best. Um, and um, we did a, a part of a special issue where we were looking at using GIS data sets to try to map out hot spots of water stress and conflict. And we used a database from our, our friends at, uh, uh, I guess, uh, Oregon State University to come up with this map of, of potential problems. These are the observations that they made in terms of potential conflict areas. And if you squint and you change the colors a little, you'll be able to see that we're picking up in otherwise cooperative zones, like in, in Europe, these red areas, which are these hot spots. And we've done this globally as well. But the, but the point is that you have these upstream, downstream contrasts. You have different kinds of resource use, different managements of landscapes or mismanagement of landscapes. And this stuff gets propagated through the river systems. And even though you might think it's a local problem, the, the problem you create winds up on someone else's doorstep. Um, let's move to the broader scale now. Um, I've shown this to, I think, the last craft conference I attended. Um, this I really love to show because it's, it's really kind of the blueprint for human development over a 200-year period. Um, all of these curves, virtually all the curves, whether it's the production of fossil fuels or gross domestic product, the loss of biodiversity, loss of uh, forests, uh, the uh, onset of uh, global telecommunications and travel, et cetera, et cetera. Has, uh, these are all social dimensions of what ultimately are played out in the Earth system, like carbon dioxide accumulating in the atmosphere and heating up the planet, okay? And all these things are going up, and all of these things have an inertia to it. And if it's any, if it's any uh, uh, lesson for us, just think of what it's taken to try to slow some of this stuff down, like in, the, in terms of the global climate game. It's just been nearly impossible. We're starting to chip away at this, but it's taken everyone political energy and goodwill and economics to try to shift these things around. But that climate question is but one of many things. This is the world that we live in. OK, now that's happening everywhere. So one of the things that, that we've been trying to map out is the patterns of these stresses. And in fact, you can map these out as an accumulation of, of localized impacts. But if you're looking at water, you can also be looking at the global scale. So water is part of the global climate system. And I'm sure you've heard of these atmospheric rivers that come dashing in off the, the uh, oceans and they dump huge amounts of water on the landscape. Well, that's a, a teleconnection between the world's oceans and the large facets of the continents, okay? That's not local water supply question. It's a global water supply question. And when El Nino comes in, all of this stuff shifts around. In addition, humans play the game of trying to replace the water that they don't have locally by importing foods and other products that require water that might not be local, but exist somewhere else, and you pay for it through an import. And this uh, set of uh, little arrows here just shows this virtual water trade, okay? Now, that's not local trade, it's global trade, and it's decisions made by multinational companies uh, that, that are really playing out here. Okay, that's, uh, in some sense, you know, the, the, the backdrop to, to all of this. Now, local versus global. Uh, I was part of um, a U.S. Arctic Research Commission uh, study on scaling in particular for Arctic research, okay? And there are a lot of Arctic researchers who research the local scale. They work on small plots of land or a village. Or 
And we discovered that there was a great interest in understanding what the Arctic system does in the Earth system more broadly. So you can no longer think about local. You've got to be thinking broader scale. So what we did is we did surveys and we, we commissioned writings for this particular uh, volume that we produced. And this set of diagrams was the result of free thinking by different disciplinary communities. Okay? And on the left there, and, and each xy plot is time on the x, uh, and, uh, sorry, distance on the x, and scale of time on the vertical axis, okay? And we asked the people who studied glaciers and ice sheets, tell us where do you study the problem? Do you have people looking at the big picture or the small picture, long time frames, short time frames? And they came up with this bubble diagram. We asked the same thing of those who do wildlife management. They came up with a very different kind of a, uh, of a diagram that has feedbacks through the different scales, and that's the way they look at wildlife management that occurs not only at the local scale, but also broadly at the regional scale. That's what they came up with. We asked the social scientists to do the same. They came up with these box uh, diagrams that divide out the social research that's being done in the Arctic. So what I would like to say is that when left to their own devices, and this I think is a message uh, for craft, the different disciplines look at scale very, very differently. And, um, you know, the micro scale to a meteorologist is very different than a micro scale to an Arctic genomics expert. You know, it's just a completely different set of um, science, sciences, basically. So the two key findings that we found that I think are re quite relevant to craft thinking are that this, these scaling issues are very disciplinary, uh, disciplinarily focused, if that's the, the right word. Uh, and because they're so focused, they hinder the interdisciplinarity. They create nomenclature problems and the culture, cultures of science that are different, that are hard to bridge. Uh, what we discovered really interestingly uh, is that there were lots of researchers in many of these fields that were working at the very broadest scale, the very macro scale, at this, and long time periods. And then there were people looking at very small spatial domains over short time periods. And the middle ground, the meso scale, is not where there was a lot of action. And I can tell you that about five years before this study, we did something similar in the Amazon and we found precisely the same thing. There are people working at these, at these very different scales with very little in the middle, despite the fact that a lot of the, the, the processes and the dynamics are very interesting, and you get all sorts of feedbacks, and you need to understand the system in the middle. Um, okay, so that was global and local. Now, risks. I'm breaking apart the little puzzle here. Let's talk about risk. Well, first of all, there, um, there are different uh, different definitions of risk, but I think from a statistical standpoint, it has to do with the probability of events, how the probability of those events exposes assets that could be damaged, and then what's the damage function? When something gets exposed to a, an extreme event, how much damage is caused? You don't lose everything, I mean, sometimes you do, but many times you expose something to an extreme event, you only have 50% damage, or 10 deaths as opposed to 1,000 deaths. Uh, anyway, the, the concatenation of all of these different processes, which you have to quantify, in my view, to get at real risk, uh, gives you that, that number, okay? And uh, I've seen the word risk and vulnerability mixed and matched all sorts of odd ways. I, I try to keep it as... Uh, as definitional as possible, and I think this is a robust enough way to look at this. We tried to um, look at uh, risks from extreme weather, and what the, the real action point here, and I think it's a craft, it's also a craft lesson, is that we're trying to combine geophysics and social sciences, okay? So on the right is flood anomalies that we were able to simulate using um, 
existing uh, historical data, and we were able to match this to the damage functions that were reported in the social science and uh, news literature, okay? And what we did is we, we combined these two guys here into a vulnerability function that played out very, very nicely. So the more intense the rainfall, the more extreme the rainfall, it simply turns out that more of the, um, of the assets were damaged. So this is the vulnerability function, okay? So we reconciled social science information, which included population data, et cetera, with these flood anomalies. And what we discovered is that if you want to look at risk to South America from extreme precipitation, there's sort of a baseline risk that people have settled in relatively dangerous areas, and about half of the risk is from the baseline climate. In the future, we're going to see uh, uh, only 12% more population, uh, sorry, climate damage, and most of the new damage is going to be coming from population um, and the interaction between population and climate. Um, we've also taken this analysis into the coastal zone. And uh, you probably can't see it here, but there are uh, 50 or I guess 48 different um, deltas that we looked at uh, that we created a relative ranking uh, both today and into the future. Again, trying to unite a geophysical perspective in, from hazardous events like cyclones, tides, waves, and floods, and what we call anthropogenic conditioning, people overbuilding the delta and not letting the delta do what it naturally does, so you interfere with the, the processes. And uh, as Pano and I were talking about what was happening in, um, in Libya, and that's a perfect example of how you know, infrastructure locally has failed. So what we did is we, we, take, we take the status quo and we created for the contemporary time frame uh, what the ranking of drainage basins and river deltas would be with no investments in protection. So just natural deltas hit by natural cyclones, et cetera. So that's just the simple biophysical risk in the contemporary zone, time zone. Then what happens after you protect the systems? Go to, go to the Rhine River. You'll see what, what the Dutch are doing to protect themselves from the incursion of, of uh, of uh, uh, water from the, the ocean. You go to the New Orleans, you'll see the same. Uh, any, any developed area has got to protect the populations that live there, OK? So you change the ranking based on how much protection you've put in. But then in the future, and we made some assumptions about you know, the era of cheap fossil fuels. You could keep building larger and larger dikes if you've got the money to do it. But eventually, you're going to exhaust that, that alternative, it's not going to work anymore. If you project out into the future, you reshuffle the ranking. Who's the most risk prone? Who's the least risk prone? And uh, just to show you what we come up with, this is the Mississippi River, and it ranks pretty high. It's a pretty dangerous river to be living at the mouth. It's a pretty dangerous place. But we've made it safe, at least today, forgetting about Katrina for the moment, but it, it, on, in general, those investments pay off. It makes the Mississippi low risk today, okay? But if we begin to see that it gets more and more expensive to protect these systems, and they fail, what if we get three or four Katrinas again? We're going to probably have to do something along the lines of moving, or it's the migration question that has interested uh, uh, Hillary for so long. Okay, so the Mississippi comes back up, the, it's more risky relative to all of the other investments that are made. Now, if you, that's a, in the developed world, so I use the Rhine and the Mississippi as examples. That's the Ganges. Ganges is dangerous to begin with, does not have much infrastructure relative to other places. And in the future, whoops, and in the future, it's simply going to be a dangerous place to live. And we know that it is, we know that it is. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is that now we have to deal not only with the geophysics, but the engineering and the built infrastructure and the decisions on when you make investments to protect or not to protect 
the assets. Now, this is happening in the deltas, but it also would happen in, in drainage basins as well. OK, so last section here is nature and society. Uh, that's another big question. Uh, OK, so uh, this diagram here just shows the dichotomy between uh, the top here, well-integrated infrastructures of natural systems, natural wetlands, managed uplands, and aquatic systems, nice green intact systems, and efficient engineering. So if you uh, put a $1 billion dam in place, make sure that the uplands are in, in an integrated way, keeping the sediment down, making sure that floods are attenuated, and you've got a, a nice even flow of water. And guess what? You'll have a pretty good, well-operating gray infrastructure. So this is the green infrastructure. This is the gray infrastructure. And it's well integrated, and it, and it works well. Avoid the bottom, which is poorly managed systems with degraded watersheds, uh, overused water supply systems, pollution, broken down, forests, wetlands, etc. If you have this upstream of a dam or reservoir that you've built for a billion dollars, guess what? You're going to lose a lot of your investment because sediment's going to clog the reservoir. You might have damage because of flooding because the land is not managed, et cetera. Now, in between, so that's the, gr the green infrastructure here. Whoops, on the left. Sorry, that's not showing up. A gray infrastructure on this side. And then in the middle is what I call human infrastructure. It's the decision-making institutions, technical capacity, and socioeconomics. And uh, respecting the notion of soundscapes and landscapes and waterscape. Is this the soundscape we're talking about? I think it has to be. It's not sound by itself. Sound is a metaphor, OK? It's really all of this stuff. It's decision making, institutions, tech, socioeconomic voices that could be heard. OK? So I'm, I'm deferring to my colleague uh, Janos here. And this is just part of the soundscape thinking, in my view. OK, uh, last couple of slides here. Uh, I wanted to say that um, as we move into the future, as we develop our water systems, and I would maybe broaden it to say, as we develop our regions, okay, there are going to be two components to every decision. What you do with the environment and how you might use the environment sensibly, and what you do in terms of technology and engineering. Okay? And in the world that I've been studying here, we're looking at engineering for water security. The top diagram here shows uh, a global map with blues and some yellows and browns. And wherever you see a blue, you see an expansion of engineering. And so a place like Africa, which doesn't have a lot of water engineering relative to the rest of the planet right now, is going to see over the uh, 45 years between 2050 and 2005, it's going to see a, like a tripling of the, um, uh, the use of, of traditional water engineering. That goes along with the expected growth in wealth. Every time you, have, you get wealth, you invest in water. And it, it's kind of hand in glove. You need both for, for uh, development. Now, on the bottom, so this is the gray infrastructure, the traditional engineering. The ra same ratio, same color bar, is for the green infrastructure, the natural capital. Okay, And guess what? We don't see much. Blue, we see a lot of the browns and the yellows, which means that we're losing the, the environmental systems. And now I'm not the only one saying this, but we mapped it out. We show that there's a loss of green infrastructure. The, the earth is being, uh, the environmental systems are being stressed and degraded by human activity. That's nothing new. However, what we tried to do is we tried to put a cost function a cost function here showing that the penalty that you pay when you have poor infrastructure is exponentially higher than when you have intact ecosystems, like I showed with the last little cartoon. And when you put it all together, you see something really, I think, kind of remarkable. Uh, first of all, you can uh, look at the, uh, the increase in the investments in traditional engineering going from, uh, from 
$0.7 trillion in the year uh, 2005 to, to $2.3 trillion in 2050. And that's for the traditional engineering. Now, because you have these green infrastructures in place, and because they're being destroyed, every new unit that's left is ever more valuable. And as best we can tell, you would, by the year 2050, you'd have to pay $3 trillion of engineering to replace the function of the green infrastructure. So obviously, you got to work with both, or your, your bill at the end of the dinner is going to be very, very expensive. OK, so here are my observations and take-homes. Um, I, I would argue, and I hope I showed enough examples here, that um, the scale of environmental security and development uh, is a continuum. And the, our, our last speaker mentioned that as well. It's not local and global. It's everything in between. And I think that the region is the sweet spot because it, it integrates with global patterns and larger context. But it also, you know, has actors on the ground who are, who are doing things locally. Um, if we're going to be talking truly about that risk question, the analytical tools need to look at the biophysics as well as the social uh, dimensions, as well as the engineering questions that, that are going to come up. And I put LSW there, because I think some variant of what we heard uh, about yesterday from, from Janusz, I think is Maybe the architecture is a little different. The nomenclature might be different, but it's there. I, I think it's there. Um, uh, global citizens. Now, I showed you lots of maps, and I started to focus on the, many of the global aspects. Um, if you notice all those global patterns that I was looking at, you, you are now in a, in a uh, position which we weren't in 20 years ago because we didn't have the data sets. But we have all these high-resolution geographic data sets that let you go right down to the local level, but yet also make summaries at the global scale. And that's an innovation that allows you to, to, to do the scaling in some sense uh, as a continuum. And that should be taken care of. And then finally, there are these three infrastructures. There's green, there's gray, and there's human. They all have to uh, work together. And I think that probably the big, there, there are gaps between looking at gray and green infrastructure, or there are, but there are probably bigger gaps looking at the human and those other two kinds of uh, infrastructures. So that's the last of my messages. I just wanted to, um, we can make this uh, available, I'm hoping for people who, who would like it, but there's a little bibliography that you could go to. And um, last time I, I spoke at the craft workshop, I spoke about food, energy, and water systems. At the time, we were writing a special, um, uh, a special issue in Frontiers in Environmental Sciences. Um, there were, uh, the number didn't come out, there were 20, there, there are 20 original research methods papers, reviews, and synthesis papers in that collection. And a lot of what I, ta I was talking about here, you can find embedded in those uh, special issue um, journal articles. So I would uh, ask you, this is all open access, you can go and download as many of these as you want. And, and it really does, I think, harmonize, and it might be a good lesson maybe for the craft thinking to, uh, to expand into. So anyway, that's the end of my talk, and I guess I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I don't know how many of us has realized that Charles Swirschmarty was speaking, you know, that and, and Sei Chenyi is on the picture there, you know, that and Mihai Swirschmarty used to be, you know, that the, 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 the good friend of him, you know, that and, and Sei Chenyi was a voter, kind of voter manager as well. But I would like to give the the floor to, to uh, Daniel Brooks, you know that, who is a professor emeritus at University of Toronto and fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. And I hope so that he will be uh, very optimistic and will give us a very optimistic lecture today, you know that, which would be a big surprise for me. Then, 
Thank you very much. Uh, in 20 minutes, I have only enough time to make some assertions. Um, I don't have any time to explain them. I'm happy to talk to anybody. The, the explanations are included in a, a book that MIT Press is bringing out in February. Um, and I'm going to be in, in Kursig at IASC until the end of November. Um, so I'm, as mo some of you know, many of you in the audience know, I'm always willing to talk. Um, so uh, my topic was also assigned to me by Ferenc, and um, I, I've, I've, I've come to, to enjoy these assignments. Uh, every time Ferenc assigns me something, then I try to figure out a way to talk about it. Um, and I'm going to talk about human risks in, in what we refer to as the autumn of the Anthropocene. That is, while many academics are arguing about whose definition of the Anthropocene is the right definition, we're at the end of it. And what we really need to be thinking about, or at least what we think we should be thinking about, is what's going to happen to us in the near future and what do we do about it. So the first assertion is that humanity has been terrible about risk assessment. We are horrible about risk assessment. For example, the, the history shows us that the optimists are always wrong. 100% of the time throughout human history, the optimists have been wrong. History also shows us that the pessimists have been too optimistic. And for those of you who think that I'm the ultimate pessimist, I would say that that was true too. I have been way too optimistic in my pessimism. So what's really at risk, okay? Turns out the technological humanity is really concerned about the biosphere disappearing and homo sapiens disappearing. But in fact, the biosphere is extraordinarily robust. It's an evolutionary system. It is a global, enormously successful evolutionary system. Homo sapiens is all over the planet in an enormous number of habitats. Neither the biosphere nor Homo sapiens as a species are actually at risk of disappearing, bar a nuclear holocaust that wipes out everything. The group of human beings that are most concerned about the biosphere and, and our species disappearing is actually the group of people who are most at risk. That is, this is what is really fragile and really at risk. The internet, electric lights, running water, flush toilets, things like that. So in our book, we've, we have taken the position that one of the things we need to do to get at better risk assessment is to change the conversation from sustainability to survival. Because sustainability has become primarily a discussion about human, how human beings can keep doing business as usual without paying a penalty. And as evolutionary biologists, this is a non-starter. Charles Darwin codified the fact that this is not possible. So we need to talk about survivability. Interestingly enough, we do actually have a theory of survival. There's only one theory of survival, and it's a biological theory. And one of the things we hear very little about in discussions of climate change and, and the future of humanity and all that, we hear very little about biology. Even the people talk about the biosphere as some sort of abstraction don't know very much about biology. They don't actually know kind of what's going on. So Darwinian evolution is the theory of survival. And Darwinian evolution is the mechanism by which the biosphere has been able to recover from enormous amounts of environmental perturbations over the last four billion years, and it has never failed. So if, in fact, we think that we should be concerned about the survival of our children and our grandchildren, it might be a good idea to think in terms of the one mechanism of survival that has never failed. And for 2.985 million years of the 3 million years of human history on this planet, human evolution was fundamentally Darwinian. And that meant that in bad times, if the conditions change, you try to cope with 
whatever you have available to you, whatever tools you have, whatever capacities you have. If you cannot cope with those changes, then you run away looking for better conditions. And if you can't run away, you die. That's, that was human evolution. That was all of evolution for most of human history. Now, in good times, human evolution during that time was also very Darwinian, and that is recognizing that necessity is not the mother of invention. Innovations do not arise magically when there is a need for them. And it doesn't happen in biology. It doesn't happen in evolution. Innovations occur when the times are good and populations can afford to experiment and not completely optimal new sorts of ideas, new sorts of innovations can actually survive, some of which then turn out to be the basis for adaptation to future changes that have been unanticipated. So 15,000 years ago, human beings did something different. We got too smart for ourselves. And nobody understood it at the time. Nobody knew it at the time because it all seemed like a good idea at the time. But human beings, about 15,000 years ago, began to depart drastically from their Darwinian tradition. And the first phase of this is what we call the great transition of the Anthropocene. This was when human beings linked permanent settlements to agriculture. Now, there were elements of agriculture, at least plant and animal husbandry, 35,000 years ago. That is before the last ice age. Human beings knew something about domestication. They knew something about uh, animal and plant husbandry. There was not what we would call real agriculture at the time. There were also, beginning about 100,000 years ago or so, there's evidence of human beings producing permanent or semi-permanent settlements. But the thing about them, and up into 15,000 years ago, the thing about those settlements was that, number one, they weren't connected with agriculture so much. And as a, res as a result of that, whenever the climate conditions changed, human beings, even if they were in a permanent settlement, human beings just left. When things got bad, they just abandoned the site and they moved someplace else looking for better conditions. But about 12,500 years ago, what we call the great amplification of the Anthropocene, human beings were overproducing agriculture. They were producing so much with this, their agriculture, what we call high production agriculture. They were producing so much, they were producing actually more than they needed. And this had two impacts. One was that it allowed them to trade food for other stuff with other people, but it also gave other people a reason to move to where those settlements were. The human beings who lived there began to identify more with that particular place, that permanent settlement, and whatever was going on in that permanent settlement, more than with their relatives who didn't live in the city, and more with, than with a set of, con, of livable conditions. So they were beginning to identify with that place, no matter who was there and no matter what the conditions were. And as a result, we begin to see the first evidence of human beings refusing to move from a place when the conditions became unlivable. And by 9,000 years ago, human beings had gone to war with themselves as a means of resolving the problem of what do we do if the conditions are unlivable, but we are not going to leave. And the, the solution that human beings came up with was, we're going to go take what we want from somebody else. And that's, that's when it all started, and we become addicted to this as the one and only way to resolve conflicts for 9,000 years. This has recently been, been called by a really, really good group at the, the Complexity Hub in, in Vienna. They've referred to this period of time as the rise of the war machines. It's what we used to be called the metal ages, right? Oh, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Copper Age, all this sort of stuff. This is the rise of the war machines. That's what actually powered metallurgy. You know, there's, a, there's an expression that's that's, is sort of a religious expression about making peace by 
by plowing swords into plowshares. But in fact, what human beings did beginning 9,000 years ago was they began producing tools specifically to kill other human beings rather than adapting you know, farm hardware to defend themselves. And at the same period of time, within these growing cities, we find the emergence of, of organized institutions of social control, which then become the primary mechanism for encouraging young people to go kill themselves. And we've, so we've seen this movie before, because we're still in that, we're still doing this. So we've seen this movie before, and we know how it ends. In the fourth or fifth century, uh, Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus, a Roman scholar wrote this famous phrase, therefore, he who desires peace should prepare for war. So by the fourth or fifth century of the Common Era, this was already codified, this behavior it was already codified. And it led to never-ending conflict with no hope of conflict resolution. There are four major errors of the Anthropocene. The first is the illusion of control, the belief that we're in control of anything on this planet. The second is the notion that growth is good and the solution to any problems is growing something, making something bigger. Um, it's not such a problem for women, but it's a huge problem for men. The third is that technology will save us. And the fourth is that it's also about survival of the fittest. Now, from the standpoint of evolutionary biology, the notion of survival of the fittest is probably the greatest example of error propagation in the history of humanity. And it's important to understand that the, the concept of survival of the fittest was imposed on evolutionary biology, biology by a sociologist, Herbert Spencer. So the Anthropocene was never sustainable. I mean, it's an enormous testimony to our, our intelligence and our creativity that we have gotten this far, following something for 15,000 years that was always going to fail eventually. Well, time is up. The problem is that in order to do something about the mess that we've created for ourselves, we have to change behavior. Because what we're doing is not following any kind of genetic imperative. This is a bunch of choices that human beings made. And every step of the way, it sounded like a good idea at the time. I mean, agriculture, this is great. The men don't have to go out and hunt dangerous animals. We can produce consistent food to feed our children. What's, what could possibly go wrong? Go wrong. Go wrong. OK? But human beings find it very difficult to change behavior. And there are three primary reasons for this. The first is that human beings have a strong need for drama. OK? And that's why crisis response is more emotionally satisfying than prevention. No politician can get elected by saying, you know the 20 terrorist attacks that we prevented in the last four years? That's on us. But a politician can get elected by saying, you know how heroic I appeared after that one terrorist attack that we didn't prevent happened? It's a perfect example of this. George Bush with the megaphone standing in the rubble of the Twin Towers in, in, in New York City. Human beings have a strong attach, attraction to magic. Okay, And the, the greatest example of that is the belief that some technology that we don't understand is going to compensate for all our bad behavior and save us. I don't want to know how the trick's done, just do it for me. And finally, human beings have a strong aversion to bad news, especially if that news requires them to take personal responsibility for the mess. So that's why it's difficult for humans to change their behavior, but we do have the capacity to do it. We have the capacity for conflict resolution. This involves, requires an interaction of familiarity, trust, and cooperation. Now, evolutionary biologists in the 20th century have created this mythology that there's something wrong about cooperation, that it's very expensive evolutionarily and it should be hard to happen and all this sort of stuff, despite the fact that there are, you know, I mean, there's an enormous amount of cooperation in the living world. 
all social species, like human beings, for example, find it easy to cooperate under circumstances where it's to their benefit. Okay? The, the greatest problem of these three, the greatest problem we have in the world today is a lack of trust. We have great familiarity, and the internet is making people more and more familiar all the time. Now, I realized this a number of years ago when one of my Hungarian uh, uh, stepkids was up on the internet at 3 o'clock in the morning and had to go to school at 8 o'clock that, that same morning. I said, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I have a friend in the Philippines, and this is the only time he can be online. So the, the internet is making us much more familiar with each other. It's not necessarily making us like each other anymore, but we are increasing in familiarity. We cooperate all the time. Trust is, is the real problem. Trust is what we don't have very much of. So what can we do if we are going to change our behavior? What kinds of, of major categories of behavioral changes do we need? The first is that we have to abandon the economics of growth. Okay? Darwin showed us that unconstrained growth is pathological. And all institutionalized economic systems, all of them in the whole history of humanity, based on are based on maximizing growth. And all of them create top-heavy, trickle-down operations that produce increasing amounts of in inequity. All of them. And we need to replace this with, with what's being called the economics of well-being. That is, Make as much money as, as you can, so long as your activities don't hurt the well-being of anybody else. It turns out there's still an enormous amount of opportunity for some people to get rich in that. You don't have to hurt other people in order to get rich, unless you're following traditional economic models. The potential to cope with, with economic transitions or transitions during uh, difficult times, such as climate change events, resides in what's called the informal economy, which all governmental systems hate, because the informal economy doesn't show up in the GDP. It doesn't show up in the tax records, tax revenues. And yet, that's where that's the driver of all transitions. The economics of well-being says that we should be doing the following. What, what all of us were taught was good family economics. You save during good times so that you have money to spend during bad times, which is exactly the opposite of what every government on this planet does. Because only if you're spending money during good times when you should be saving money, only then can you appear heroic to your voters. And finally, we need to circularize economies as, as much as possible. OK. Second, not high-density cities in climate insecure places. Nearly 60% of humans live in cities as opposed to rural areas now. More than half of humanity is, is jammed into cities. More than 50% of human beings live within 100 kilometers of the ocean. They are all in climate insecure places. And people who do not live in those climate insecure places, who feel that they're secure because they're not there, do not understand the potential threat to their lives that stems from chaotic climate retreat. Uh, and, and Hillary will talk a bit about managed retreat, and, but this is, this is the reason we, we absolutely have to engage in managed retreat now. But we know that this is true. We know that big crowded cities are a problem, not a solution, because every single post-apocalyptic film and, and novel shows that cities are places that people need to run away from if they feel threatened. There's not a single movie. You've never seen a single movie or read a single science fiction novel that says, 
oh my God, there's a huge, there's a huge problem. Let's all run to the city. So we know this. People know this. What we need are low-density communities in climate-secure places. We need managed climate retreat. We need to revitalize rural areas. We need to circularize those new economies and join them, those new circular economies, and join them in cooperative networks, increasing their self-determination. So in other words, we need to start asking those communities what they want and what they need, as opposed to saying, hey, I've got a big, I've got a plan and I'm going to impose it on you, and trust me, it's for your own good. You'll, you'll, you'll thank me later. None of that's been working out, of course. And we need to be really, really concerned about institutions of social control. Social institutions arose 10,000 years ago with cities with growing populations of people who were unfamiliar with each other. Remember now, familiarity, trust, cooperation. The people who were unfamiliar with each other, so they didn't know who to trust, even though they had to work with those people in order to cooperate with those people in order to make the city function properly. So social control seemed like a really good idea at the time. The problem is that institutions of social control in cities where you have increasing numbers of people who don't know each other very well become vulnerable to being used by people who want to amplify their personal power and take control. So institutions that were originally meant to help people cooperate with each other, no one knew, but they turned out to be mechanisms whereby sociopaths could take over and, and get people to do really bad things. We can do something about that that does not involve just going back to hunter-gatherer bands. In other words, there is a middle ground in all of this, okay? And that comes from co-accommodating institutions. And this is where the idea of, of networks, of cooperating small circular economies uh, comes up, that they can, in fact, uh, maintain the benefits of, without the vulnerabilities of these large, uh, densely populated cities. But this is only going to happen if social institutions have what we call a fiduciary interest. That is, if they are required to, to implement what the people want to do, even if they know that it's going to be a mistake. Because the only way you're going to rebuild public trust in public institutions is to allow the public institutions to help you do what you want to do, and if it fails, and they say, okay, what if we try this other thing? At that point, they will trust you. But we're at a point in the world now where it's been exactly the opposite for 9,000 years. There's some disembodied sociopath telling you what you're going to do. And for some reason that nobody seems to understand, regular human beings don't like that. The Great Unraveling, what we, we call the Autumn of the Anthropocene, but, but which uh, another author has, has published a book with this title, The Great Unraveling, which I, I actually like better than ours. Um, it's what is going to become of us in the near future. Now, the two varieties of what are being called climate change porn that we see in, in the news media now are, oh, it's, there's going to be a, an apocalypse, everybody's going to die, the biosphere is going to die, Blah, blah, blah. And the opposite is, no, we're going to have a technological utopia. Let's just pour money into the same kinds of technological research that, that are not helping. But eventually, if we pour enough money into it, it it'll work. And, and what, what Sal and I are offering in, in our book is two options that are in the middle. Okay, one is that we're going to change our behavior, and we're going to see some kind of societal bottleneck in the not too distant future because we're well into the penalties for this bad behavior now. We're not gonna be able to stop or reverse anything. But there may be a bottleneck that we can rebound from. Or we can just continue business as usual and keep talking and talking and talking and doing nothing, not changing our behavior. At which point, 
the projections by people like, like uh, 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 the report by Turner uh, in 2015 from the Melbourne Sustainable Studies Institute will come true. There will be a general collapse of human civilization about 2050, and we will have to rebuild. Now, the good thing is that whether it's going to be a bottleneck and rebound or a collapse and rebuild, the same principles could be useful in, in guiding that because evolution is both about survival and about rebounding, about coming back. It's, all, it's about who survives and who, who re-diversifies among the survivors. So whether we just go through a bottleneck or whether we collapse, the, the principles that we suggest can all be used uh, to, to benefit humanity if, in fact, that kind of threat comes true. I mean, uh, I've been telling people, I want to live to, to 2050. I'll only be 99 years old then. I want to live then because I want to be wrong. And I want people to laugh at me in 2050 and say, it wasn't as bad as you thought it would be. So that's, that's our, our hope, the hope for the Anthropocene. And it turns out that that particular Darwinian vision is very much compatible with the, the, the uh, classic myth of the phoenix, or for the younger people in the audience, the Harry Potter version of the phoenix. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Don. So, because we are in the same age, you know, that I'm 75, like, like, <laughs> like he is, you know, so probably I would like to survive till 95, especially because my grand-grandfather died when he was 75, and he was cutting the wood to make the fire to cook the food for the, that day, so he made the job. So I wish you this one, and I hope so that we have two uh, uh, researchers from the IASC, you know, that and uh, I hope so that they will protect a little bit the agricultural sector, you know, that the agriculture, you know, because Don basically said that everything has started to be wrong when, when this sector became more and more uh, stronger. So the one speaker is Herman Tomás, you know, that and he's a, a agricultural engineer, you know, that I'm dealing with soil sciences, basically, and uh, try to categorize the different kind of soils. And he, he has a, a PhD degree, you know, that and, and basically dealing recently with, with the precise uh, agriculture. I think so this is one hope as a technology. And uh, he has the presentation together with Stankovic Petra, which she has a very interesting, uh, you know, that background because she is a lawyer, uh, but she studied environmental law as well. And uh, basically, she, I have heard some of her presentations already. You know that how important to uh, clarify the the property rights for the land and for the soil. And I don't know how you will share your uh, job here, you know that, and I know we are out of time a little bit. It was the mistake of the organizers, Professor Mislivets wanted me to be the, the regulator and I'm not a good time manager, you know that, and you see that all the all the emeritus professors are bad about the time management. I enjoyed very much the presentations. You know that I felt the flow according to Chicks and Mihai, so I will, I will not regulate your presentation as well, you know, that because you are the, you are the future. And certainly, I, I think so that, uh, that the future is, we have future. Don and myself, we would like to survive an additional 20 years in, in a nice, world and uh, as I know the only two things which is uh, very valuable this is learning and loving and if we are learning and loving in during our life then we will be happy so I wish you all of you to be happy and especially for the young generation so please
what are the three environmental elements that we all need to survive? I guess in everybody's mind, <laughs> water and air already came up, but the third one is the soil. And which of these elements is not regulated with a legally binding act on international level? This is again soil. <laughs> so we will talk about soil, soil protection from a soil scientist point of view by my co-presenter, Tamás Hermann, and I will talk about the policy part of the soil. But why, why do we need to legislate soils? And especially why do we need to legislate from a protective point of view? Because for centuries, the soil functions were maintained without regulation as well. Until the 20th century. And as research shows now, more than one third of the arable land is affected by degradation. And more than 60% of uh, land on the world without ice is in bad and unhealthy state. And one of the many rules, one of the many role of rule is to legislate the um, influence or legislate the people behavior for ha to have a more sustainable soil management practice. And what do we see on international level? First, I will show and present you the international level, then I will move on to uh, a supranational level, still the EU level, and after that I will present the national level as well. So on international level, of course, there is no overarching authority to legislate um, soil. But maybe all of you heard about the UN, FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, this is works as a central hub for soil-related activities. Or maybe you're much more familiar with sustainable development goals and the uh, sustainable development goal 50.3 is the land degradation neutrality. So we have to achieve land degradation neutrality until uh, 2030. There is only, this, this list is all soft laws, as you can see. There is only one legally binding treaty for those who signed it, this United Nations Convention to Combat Desert Desertification. The problem with this, that it's only, the scope of it is only the dry areas. So maybe if we wait until all the land dries out, we will fall under the scope of this treaty. But otherwise, there is no uh, international um, legislative act regarding soil protection. Maybe the mm, more, most comprehensive one is the Alpine Convention. It's very complex, but this goes only for the Alpine. So this is what we see on international level. Let's move on uh, to the EU level in soil governance. The European Green Deal, you I guess everybody heard about is a growth strategy of the EU has very ambitious ambitious measures for the green transition and wants to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And for this, it released a um, combination of elements regarding soil, soil policy. One is the EU, EU soil observatory. It's a long-term data reservoir, a long-term database. And the soil deal for Europe, <laughs> these, these are uh, responsible for the funding mechanisms. And the soil strategy with the upcoming soil health law. Last time when I talked about in a craft conference about this new uh, soil health law, we did not know much about it. But today we can state that the um, proposal is already on the table of the parliament of the EU. And we know a lot of uh, things about it or, uh, already. For example, it focuses on the definition of soil health. And this will be a great achievement if there will be a unified definition of soil health. 
it has a framework for soil health monitoring. And maybe this will be the biggest uh, highlight or achievement of this soil health law. In short, they are called it um, soil monitoring law uh, already because it has a new harmonized methodology EU-wide how to measure soil health and how to monitor soil health. And also there will be a voluntary certification system together with the carbon farming certification for farmers, but this will be voluntary. We have to state uh, positively that this is the first step uh, EU level law regards soil protection. But the green lobby already says that it's a lion without teeth because there are no strict obligation, no strict limitation um, that, that would be um, uh, nice to have the farmers and uh, land management to follow. So there, is, there are no limitation, for example, um, in regards soil sealing. But this soil health law is not without a history, because 10 years ago there was already a proposal on the table of the Commission uh, and the Parliament of the EU, but five blocking countries voted against it. And in I ask our environmental research group, we did a research where we compared and analyzed the soil protection legislation of these five countries and compared it to the proposal, and we asked why did it fa fail? And what we came out is the usually all these countries had stricter, higher regulation in different aspects of soil dependent threats of soil de de mm, degradation, for example, erosion, contamination. But in case of soil sealing, mm, the proposal was stricter and on a higher level. That's why we think that one of the main reasons for the rejection was the um, question of soil sealing. We have uh, had other, other findings on national level governance and legislation and administration of soils. The member states are introducing many types of soil protection measures, but usually the economic policy to increase employment and attracting foreign investments enjoys priority over um, land protection. And uh, it would be, there will be a, it's never needed to prohibit greenfield investments until brownfield sites are eliminated. And with this, uh, I could show you all the three levels. And as a summary, uh, I put here all the level most important, um, most important sentences. For example, international land and soil governments but we see there is a lot of soft loose, so not hard loose, a lot of soft loose and a lack of power on EU level. Although it's a great achievement that we already, we hopefully in November there there will be a released um, soil protection law, but without strict obligations and limitations beyond monitoring and the national level. The although on national level there is the power to legislate soil protection, but the economic goals takes priority over soil protection. And with this, I give the floor to my co-presenter, Tomás Erman. Thank you. Fast switch. Uh, so I try to uh, give some overview uh, uh, with the example how to do local action, how to do the local uh, land management practices and uh, rural development. So think uh, globally, act locally. Uh, the uh, local actions is not uh, uh, so easy. Uh, regional, sub-regional and local action is always need an uh, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, the most uh, priority is uh, to preserve cultural heritage, also uh, natural and built uh, heritage with the maintain of ecosystem services, with the continui continuation of uh, sustainable uh, regional land management. In our uh, society, uh, has, uh, have <coughs> we have a uh, lot of uh, demands and problems. Uh, the demands increasing uh, pressure by human population, 
uh, demand for food security, better environment, uh, uh, more sustainable agriculture, or demand to obtain higher income in, uh, in the rural areas. And also we have uh, many problems. And this is evident, land and soil degradation processes uh, uh, is spread across landscapes in many countries. And uh, also big problem, uh, little or no awareness of the importance of uh, landscape and soil. Uh, so answer and uh, providing answer uh, to these uh, demands can be, can be very difficult because uh, a lot of direction and sometimes this direction is opposite way and uh, can be very complex like uh, the environmental sustainability. Uh, if we uh, focusing uh, one or all of the direction uh, and the answers uh, requiring in a different scale, not only local, but also global scale, of course. And, um, and the evaluation processes is always uh, multifunctional. Uh, we have other problems like uh, the data quality and the quantity. Uh, we cannot achieve uh, all of the data sets in uh, different scales. So the data quality varying and also quantity, avail availability. And uh, the important processes uh, in soils and landscapes is not a static uh, uh, process. And uh, because of these dynamic processes, uh, uh, the evaluation uh, methods is, uh, uh, is very, uh, need a very complex and multifunctional way. Uh, five years ago, we started a new project, uh, uh, namely the land support. And the land support uh, main goal was uh, to create, develop a new web-based land evaluation, uh, land de decision support system. Uh, <coughs> the consortium uh, uh, realized um, uh, the life and all the direction uh, of this um, environmental processes is very complex. So um, we, or the consortium, the project uh, needs a, a very strong and uh, a new uh, way of thinking, a new uh, hard and strong machine and uh, with a strong engine. Uh, so we uh, don't, we, we cannot uh, simplify uh, this environmental complexity. Also the visualization and, uh, uh, and also in the deeper processes we need uh, to, uh, uh, to do this deep analysis. A lot of uh, um, answers has already exist. Uh, so a lot of project uh, ongoing with different uh, perspectives. And uh, uh, the land support project with this new car and with this new uh, strong engine would like to collect all of this uh, uh, new already developed uh, models and uh, collecting all the available uh, data sets in, in a different uh, scale. And uh, after after that, uh, in one framework, we can create scenarios. So uh, we cannot uh, say, so the software or the newly developed uh, web-based evaluation system uh, cannot uh, uh, give uh, one uh, solution, but uh, there, there were uh, options. And, um, mm, and the final, output and final um, <clears throat> uh, software product outcome of this uh, output of this project uh, was uh, um, real uh, physically available online decision support system. So this is uh, also a, a framework, but also a, a, a toolbox uh, uh, and also uh, the uh, 
summarizing uh, or uh, storing all of the available uh, 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 European and national data sets. So uh, in the right side, you can uh, reach the toolboxes. Uh, the to in the toolbox, there are several tools. And the, you can uh, manage in an easy way uh, uh, one uh, evaluation or analysis. So we can we can reach the uh, the uh, the raw data sets too, but uh, we can like uh, solar rad radiation or precipitation data sets or uh, other soil information, soil water stress, some uh, data sets from digital elevation models like aspect slope. But uh, we can use also uh, <coughs> also uh, more uh, complex uh, tools uh, analysis uh, uh, like a pesticide pesticide fate tool which is uh, used for groundwater visualization and analyze the groundwater vulner vulnerability and also uh, we have uh, more complex uh, uh, indices like Winkler index which is uh, good for, for uh, the land suitability analysis so this is a uh, it, uh, uh, we finished this uh, project last year, but uh, we, we uh, just finalized the reporting period uh, of uh, another H 2020 uh, project, uh, the CEU soil project. Uh, we, the ISK was the main, main uh, IS task was uh, to managing this soil management methods VP2. And the uh, uh, CEO uh, project uh, cooperation with uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, several Chinese institute uh, is the main aims was to develop the, uh, sustainable soil management uh, practices based on common information systems. <coughs> uh, so we analyzed uh, a lot of uh, uh, local scale on local scale information, a lot of local scale uh, soil management practices uh, in Europe and China too. China too. Um, main uh, evaluation was uh, to uh, characterize spatial variability uh, in yield, uh, uh, analyze soil quality and land resources, uh, assess the yield potential and uh, also develop the web-based uh, evaluation system. Uh, we found uh, uh, in, in uh, local scale, so in agricultural practices, the local scale is more than in uh, rural development. Uh, in in uh, agricultural practices, the local scale is a field, but uh, a little bit deeper, the management zones which is a sub-parcel uh, uh, unit. And we realized that uh, 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 during this uh, information, uh, collecting this information technologies, the geophysics is very uh, nice and complex way to, uh, to characterize the soil information um, in a... Uh, in a, in a, within the parcel. And the geophysics is a, a complex measurement and uh, we can achieve the key parameters uh, like uh, uh, composition, structure of soil, uh, type and depth of uh, parent material, groundwater levels, humus uh, content and layering. And uh, so uh, uh, we, we can, uh, uh, focusing during the precision agriculture techniques uh, to these uh, geophysics uh, measurements because uh, it's uh, crucial that uh, we can, uh, uh, this crucial task to delineate the best uh, 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 land management uh, areas, best uh, 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 heterogeneity uh, uh, in within the field 
And finally, we can uh, reach, uh, analyze to, uh, through this uh, land management uh, units the yield stability. So we can uh, select the more stable, uh, unstable, and uh, medium uh, yield stability or fertility uh, part of the parcels. So uh, in the local level, it's very important the data collection about also about environmental uh, uh, and also the uh, environment and also the society. And uh, uh, with the integration of these data sets and the integration of ability available models, uh, we can reach the real complex. Uh, evaluation and real complex uh, uh, craft methodology. And I hope uh, uh, it will be not a future plan, maybe in the future will be a real project uh, to, to reach the real craft data center within the Synergy Campus, which will be a smart uh, IT infrastructure uh, to store, share, uh, and evaluate all of the uh, data sets and models, uh, use models from the uh, uh, environment, uh, uh, environment and uh, also the, from the uh, society to reach the real sustainable regional development. Thank you.